Okay, in this video, we're going to continue on with the idea of the second messenger systems. Previously, you learned about second messenger systems um, with respect to the adenylate cyclase pathway. So if you recall, one of the things that we said, we said there are two famous second messenger systems, uh, the first of which involves the amplifier enzyme called adenylate cyclase, and the second of which involves another amplifier enzyme, and this one is called phospholipase. So we've already reviewed adenylate cyclase and how all that stuff works, and um, we're going to move on now into the second famous second messenger system. What I would encourage you is that if you're unclear on how the second messenger systems work, in other words, if you still have no clue about how this whole thing works, then I would actually recommend that you go review that before we get into the phospholipase system. Um, the phospholipase has just a couple of extra steps and adenylate cyclase is, is just a little bit simpler because of that fact. So if you are unclear, please go ahead and do that before you watch this video. So our learning, <clears throat> excuse me, our learning objectives for this one then are to describe the sequence of events in the phospholipase second messenger system, as well as identify what does a protein kinase do. Um, and actually, we've already done what does a protein kinase do. You know that it phosphorylates things, and so we're going to see that again in the phospholipase system. So let's um, go ahead and get started. This is our our main slide where we want to spend most of our time, and this should look really really familiar to you because it should look a lot like what you saw here with the adenylate cyclase. And what I mean by that is in terms of kind of the graphics, the presentation and stuff. So remember that this was how adenylate cyclase worked, um, and then this now is then how the phospholipase system works. And so let's start from the very beginning, just like we did previously, and we'll say that well you got a hormone, and this is your signal molecule, and in, in our case it's going to be called a hormone. So why not just say hormone? Why do why do these guys write in signal molecule? Well they wrote that in because um, as I had mentioned before, neurotransmitters can also operate through this second messenger pathway. And so that signal molecule in some cases could be a neurotransmitter, um, in other cases it could be a hormone. Um, because, we're speaking about, because we're speaking about this in the context of the endocrine system, for us, this signal molecule is a hormone. So what's the hormone? It's this yellow guy right over here. So let's walk it through. Step number one, hormone binds to receptor. Nothing new, just the same old story as before. A hormone binds to the receptor. Just to go back again, what did we see in the adenylate cyclase system? Hormone binds to receptor, okay? So continuing on then, what happens from there? Again, asking that series of questions. Okay, great, hormone bound to receptor. What happens next? Who cares, so what? Well. What does the receptor do from there? The receptor will activate a G protein. And that's all listed right over here. Signal molecule, or the hormone, activates the receptor and the associated G protein. So the receptor will activate that G protein. So your next question then is, okay, great, I activated a G protein. Who cares? So what? Well, here's why we care about that, because the G protein will then activate the amplifier enzyme. And in this case, the name of the amplifier enzyme is phospholipase. So yes, it's called phospholipase C. We're just going to call it phospholipase just to make life easy. So up until now, you should kind of be sitting there nodding your head and thinking, okay, nothing is new. Nothing is new. Well, the adenylate cyclase pathway, again, hormone binds to receptor, receptor binds to G protein, G protein turns on amplifier enzyme. In this case, it was called adenylate cyclase. And in this case today, right now, it's called phospholipase. It's a different amplifier enzyme. Okay, so again, um, I'm going to try not to jump back too much adenylate cyclase. I'm doing that hopefully, hoping that it'll help you to draw parallels to say you actually know half of this pathway already. Not even having started it, you already know half of it. So here's where this pathway diverges and is a little bit different from the adenylate cyclase. So we ask the question, just like we did in the other pathway, what does phospholipase do? That's the question. You, you got to ask that question. Um, okay, fine. I turned on, uh, I, I bounded the receptor. Receptor turns on G protein. G protein turns on um, phospholipase. And then what does phospholipase do? That's where we're at. So the name kind of tells you what it does because the name is phospholipase. If you recall from other stuff that you've already learned, when you see that thing that ends in ACE, when you see that thing that ends in ACE, then that really says it's an enzyme. And so a phospholipase is gonna be an enzyme that splits a phospholipid. That, that's really what it does. So phospholipase is just the name of an enzyme that's gonna split a phospholipid. So if you don't know what a phospholipid is, please go back or just, just pause the video, pull up a browser and do a quick Google image search just to remind you what a phospholipid looks like. Remember that the membrane of all our cells is a phospholipid bilayer. 
So phospholipase is going to split a phospholipid. And so when I split a phospholipid right over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that phospholipid, I'm going to split it into two parts. And one part is called DAG, D-A-G. Another part is called IP3, inositol triphosphate. So here's the key over here. DAG is called diacylglycerol, and IP3 is inositol triphosphate. You should know all those names. You should know all those names. So again, what does phospholipase do? It takes a phospholipid and essentially cuts it in half. It's not literally half, but you get my meaning here. It takes a phospholipid and it splits it. And when it's split, one half of it is called diacylglycerol, and the other half of it is called inositol triphosphate. Now, I'm going to throw one more name at you, and I want to name the phospholipid, because not all phospholipids are created the same. There, there's different varieties, different flavors of phospholipids. And so the name of the phospholipid that I end up splitting is this guy, phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate. And again, I know it's a mouthful, but there it is for you. Phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate is the name of the phospholipid that's split in half by an enzyme named phospholipase. And when this guy gets split in half, the two halves are called diacylglycerol, and the other one is called inositol triphosphate. These guys then are the second messengers, meaning that these are the equivalent to cyclic AMP of that other pathway. Okay, so where are we now? Well, then just like we, we did before, you asked the question, okay, great, I, I split a phospholipid in two halves, and the two halves are named DAG and IP3. What happens from there? Well, here's what happens. Diacylglycerol has a job, and what is his job? His job is to activate a membrane-bound protein kinase. So what does that mean in English? It means it's, it's a protein kinase, and remember, you already know what they do. What do protein kinases do? They phosphorylate things. So what do I mean by membrane-bound? What I mean by that is that it's just embedded within the cell membrane. That's all it means. So diacylglycerol is going to activate a membrane-bound protein kinase. And what does the protein kinase do? The protein kinase then will go on and phosphorylate a whole bunch of different proteins. So as we talked about previously, and again, this is why I need you to really get a grip on that um, adenylate cyclase pathway before you watch this video. As we talked about before, proteins and enzymes are often in an inactive form. And how do we turn them on? We turn them on, again, not in all cases, but in many cases. How do we turn them on? We turn them on by tagging it or sticking it with phosphate group, PO4. So what we're looking at here, P with the subscript I is inorganic phosphate. That's what it means. It's PO4. And that gets attached to some protein. And who does the attaching? It's protein kinase. And now we've got a phosphorylated enzyme or phosphorylated protein who then goes off and does stuff. When it says here cellular response, it means that now that protein is activated and now it can do whatever he's designed to do. And we can deliberately and intentionally be vague there when we say cellular response, okay? Because enzymes are the workhorses of chemistry. So now what we've done is that we've wrapped up diacylglycerol. So what question remains? The question that remains is, okay, great, what's up with IP3 then? I took phospholipase and uh, he split a phospholipid in half into DAG and IP3. So now I know what diacylglycerol does. Well, what about IP3? Well, here's what IP3 does. Again, IP3 is inositol triphosphate. What he will do, IP3 will actually go to the endoplasmic reticulum. You remember the endoplasmic reticulum as, a, uh, as an organelle? You learned that before. And what it will do at the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, it is it will trigger the release of ionic calcium. And that's this calcium. Two plus means it's in its ionic state. So that calcium ends up being released. And calcium, and we're just going to leave it at this. you got to trust me on this. Calcium is used often as an intra, within a cell, intracellular uh, messaging system. So calcium is used as an intracellular messenger to make stuff happen. If that seems like memorization to you, uh, the calcium part, I, I get that. But let me, try to, let me try to refresh your memory. Have you ever seen calcium being used as an intracellular signal? So go ahead and pause the video and think it through. The question again is, have you ever seen calcium being used as an intracellular signaler? And if you paused the video and took some time to think about it, hopefully what you came up with is, you know what I have? I saw that with sarcomeres. In sarcomeres and skeletal muscle, I saw the endoplasmic reticulum storing calcium. In that case, we gave it the fancy name sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I saw calcium being released and when calcium was released, it bound to troponin, 
which then underwent a conformational change to make all this good stuff happen, which led to the sliding filament model. In other words, the, the release of calcium initiated a cellular response in the case of skeletal muscle, which would be skeletal muscle contraction. Now, in this case, it's a little bit different because uh, in skeletal muscle, it was an action potential that ended up ultimately leading to the trigger of calcium release. In this case, it's different. It's the second messenger pathway. So I'm not trying to say they're the same thing. What I'm trying to say is true or false. You've seen calcium being used as an intracellular messenger before, and the answer is true. You just maybe didn't think of it in those terms, but now you can think of it in those terms. And so what I want you to see is that skeletal muscles aren't the only things that allow, uh, that, that require or use calcium as an intracellular messenger. There are plenty of other examples as well too. And those things are oftentimes activated by this second messenger pathway. Okay, so that'll be it. But let me, let me, let me walk through it one more time. Hormone binds to receptor, so what? Receptor, well, we care because receptor turns on G protein. So what? Well, G protein turns on phospholipase. Okay, great, who cares? So what? Phospholipase splits a phospholipid whose name is phosphatidoinositol bisphosphate into two halves. And the names of those halves are diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate. So what? Well, diacylglycerol activates a membrane-bound protein kinase, so what? Which then phosphorylates proteins and enzymes to get stuff done. Great. What about IP3? IP3 then travels to the endoplasmic reticulum to trigger the release of intracellular calcium, which then gets stuff done as well too. All right. So who's the first messenger here? The hormone. Who is the second messenger? Well, in this case, there are two second messengers, diacylglycerol and inositol uh, triphosphate. One of the questions that has come up before, which is a great question, is like, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. I get it. First messenger, second messenger right over here. Couldn't you think of calcium as being a third messenger? And my answer is, yeah, you kind of could. Calcium could be considered a third messenger. I don't think it's technically referred to as a third messenger in this pathway, um, but functionally, it serves as a third messenger. That is the case. Um, so I'm, I will never ask you, what is the third messenger? I'll never ask you that formally because I think technically it's not referred to that way. But uh, again, for all intents and purposes, that's kind of what it is. All right, this is another look at the phospholipase system from another textbook, another artist. It's all the same thing. Um, I'm not gonna spend time here. There are some hormones that take advantage of the phospholipase system. You don't have to memorize that list. It's just there if you care, if you wanna know about it. Um, and that's that. So a generic summary of the second messenger systems. Again, you can look at this slide on your own. You should have access to the PowerPoints. Um, and this is talking about a lot of things that we just did. That's why I say it's a generic summary. Um, there's amplifier enzymes, there's second messenger molecules that lead to a variety of responses, uh, a variety of triggers that leads to a cellular response. Um, and then actually, and that's it. I think I just want to end the video right there. So describe the sequence of events in the phospholipase second messenger system. You should be able to do that now. And what does a protein kinase do? You already knew that, but as a reminder, it phosphorylates inactive enzymes. That'll wrap it up for this video.